class was a disaster! Never touched another frog again after that day. But turning selfish princes into beasts really helped elevate my grades. So for our <laughs> next review, I figured we should smother ourselves in chocolate and... Oh, Clary, what are you giggling at? It's just my old school yearbook, Sirius. <laughs> school? You actually went and survived one of those tiny people prisons? Well, duh! You can't just let any fey grant wishes! They're standards! A formal fairy education! I studied intensively to become a fairy godmother, got my diploma and license to grant wishes, and did... not much with it. After that, I kind of became a hippie traveling in a giant hat causing problems. I never got the chance to grant wishes for humans on Earth. You were a tiny gremlin child back then, so you may not remember. I remember. Trust me, I tortured a fruit baby after kicking her down a hill, watched a pirate get crushed by a giant ham, and then we went to P.F. Chang's to destroy racism. I had an eventful childhood. I miss going out in that old hat too. Why don't we get that old hunk of junk running again? Because, Clary, I suffer from a horrible disability called laziness. For our next review, we should do something school-themed! Something school-themed? <sighs> Alright then, time to go grave robbing. So Casper is a character no one cares about, but if you insist... Casper the Friendly Ghost was created in the 1930s by Seymour Wright and Joseph Aurelio for a children's storybook. When Seymour was away on military service during World War II, Joseph decided to sell the rights of the book to Paramount Pictures for a grand total that would go down in history as the highest price sold for anything ever! $175. <laughs> well, thank you, Grandpa Paramount. Aren't you just generous? I could buy me a whole spanking body pillow with that kind of money. And this one-time payment was all that they received. Missing out on even a share of the revenue earned from all other media to come. Ouch! The first Casper short, The Friendly Ghost, was released in 1945. And he eventually was featured in over 50 theatrical cartoons up to 1959, which was when Harvey Comics who already published the popular Casper comic series beginning in 1952, purchased the character outright. And can you believe all of those escapades eventually led up to DreamWorks and Universal Pictures acquiring the Casper license in 2012? And they've left the property unchecked to fester in its own coffin. I guess making 15 more Shrek movies was more important to them than actually wanting to make another Casper- <gasps> Oh, wait. They didn't even do that! Despite still being recognizable in pop culture, Casper really hasn't done much. Of course there was the 1995 live-action movie, noted for being much darker than the previous versions as well as being the first feature film to have a fully CGI character in the lead. But aside from a few cartoons, he's fittingly dead as a ghost. His last appearance was a cameo in Harvey Girls Forever, a 2018 cartoon that was meant as a tribute to the Harvey comic book characters. No oh, thanks, but being a scary ghost was, well, scary. <laughs> I, I want to be me. I guess I'm kind of like a- Friendly ghost! No, no, that sounds ridiculous. But fret not all four fans of Casper, for a new live-action television series is in the works with the ghost bride creator Wu Kaiyu writing and executive producing. All I'm saying is, hopefully it won't be another Riverdale. But today, we're looking at the last Casper movie, as well as the pilot for the last Casper series, Casper Scare School. There is a very good reason why Scare School was the last time Casper was the focus of anything. It's because whoever was responsible for this nonsense used up all of the school's budget. <laughs> so now, the poor kids are left with this humiliation to be reminded by every time the substitute teacher gets bored of doing their jobs. 
This 2006 straight-to-TV and DVD movie was directed by Mark Gravas, who went on to create the show Adventure Beasts. But before this movie, he directed such holiday classics as... Mariah Carey, Santa Claus is coming to town, and here comes Peter Cottontail, the movie! <laughs> we also got a quadruple threat writers team, with Kirk D'Amico, who wrote the Croods movies, Bob Menthol, who did work on a lot of Nickelodeon shows, and finally, Daryl Vickers and Andrew Nichols, both of whom wrote for a lot of Canadian shows I grew up with. But no more wasting our lives away! Let's instead waste it more by watching Casper's Scare School. Boy, this Edward Scissorhands cartoon really blows. We start off with some mischievous spirits, the ghostly trio, Stinky, Stretch, and Fatso. And if those were their names when they were alive, no wonder they died! They died of sheer embarrassment! They're voiced respectively by John DiMaggio, Dan Castellaneta, and Billy West. Three extremely talented men who've done incredible work for a lot of great cartoons. This is not one of them. In the famed town of why are we watching this, we meet Stretch, Stinky, Brendan Fraser's The Whale, and Banana Cheese Woman. Banana Cheese. Banana Cheese. Banana Cheese. Banana Cheese. The patrons of his off-putting supermarket get scared by said ghosts. All the while, they're running around with the same amount of urgency to take a crap on Black Friday. Uh. Why are the ghosts haunting this store for no clear reason? I would love to answer that, but like the animators of this movie, I don't really care to do my job. So, Clary, you're up! The job of ghosts and monsters in this world is to spook the humans, known to them as Fleshies. But the trio's nephew, Casper, isn't there for their big supermarket scare. Instead, Casper is busy with his friend. Casper, ah! it's just me! Oh my god, Mother, I'm more scared of the humans than the monsters! Let's discuss the painfully obvious. This movie is uggo to the extremo. The character design in this movie is lifeless, and I know it's a movie about ghosts, but look at the lack of detail in their appearances. They're stiff as mannequins, giant heads, dead eyes, tiny hands. This isn't a case of cartoon stylization. The proportions are just awful and unbalanced. Their mouths are so close to their chins and their mouths are so far away from their eyes. Aside from people like this teacher in a ball who looks like she belongs in a completely different movie. I think they were trying to make the characters have similar proportions to Casper, but it doesn't work for a majority of the body and facial shapes we encounter. And even the ghosts have problems too. The ghosts don't have any clarity to their textures. They don't look like ghosts. Shadows reflect on their skin. Ghosts shouldn't have shadows. Yet they're so much more expressive than the humans who barely emote. And the character design isn't the only problem with this film's presentation. The textures, lighting, the colors, it's all so dull. Also, look at all of these repeated assets. The houses, the cars, the boxes. There's so much blatant recycling. The room and environment design has all the depth of a kitty car mat. And everything is so tiny compared to the characters. Simply put, it's ugly, repetitive, and uninspired. They should have worked within the limitations of their software rather than taking lazy shortcuts. Anyway, this horror beyond comprehension is known by the Necronomicon as Jimmy. He's voiced by Brett Del Buono. Don't bother remembering his name, his creation went like this. Hello, this is the writing team. We'd like to order a child. Oh, no one will care who. It's Casper's Scare School. Stop snickering! Anyway, Casper here is played by then-teen actor Devin Werkheiser, star of Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. Try it again. But this time, kick it with your laces instead of your toe. As I climbeth this ladder, writ upon you, a kiss I shall place. Oh, Romeo! And while Devin doesn't do a bad job in acting, it's just awkward hearing that deep a voice from what's supposed to be an elementary school student. But our ghosty boy has some personal problems. Casper's uncles want him to be a scary haunter like them. But Casper just wants to be a normal kid with a teenager's voice and play ball with Jimmy, his best abominably rancid friend. Or Barf for short. 
Honestly, I'm with Casper on this one. Barf here, along with the rest of the humans, are the scariest things we've seen in this movie so far. But Casper is still pathetic for being scared by a stupid kid. No wonder why people stopped making movies about him. <laughs> The trio takes the brunt of Casper's tardiness and are being interrogated by the king of the underworld, Kai Bosch. Voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson. <sighs> if we are friendly to fleshies, then they'll lose their fear of us. And if they lose their fear of us, they'll rise up against us. The fleshies will rise up against us. By the way, Kevin is the only voice actor here that feels like he's genuinely enjoying the role. He devours the scenery and leaves no crumbs. Then again, he's awesome in whatever role you give him. So Slimer's daughter is angry at the trio for not teaching Casper to be scary enough. Where is your nephew? Uh, Casper? Oh, uh... I heard humans screaming at the library. I think that was him. No, no, no. I saw a woman fainting downtown. Oh, I think that was him. Right now, we're going to go from booyah to boo-boo. That's right, Jim. We turn now from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. You're not going to believe this polter goof in Deedstown. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, you know you didn't want that to happen. You gotta hope Kaibosh isn't watching. How did they get that footage? No, I don't care if it was comedy. It's plot crucial. I also love how no one notices the ghost flying down the street. In this world, ghosts are forced to be scary for fear of fleshies rising against them. And because Casper isn't scary, he's considered a threat to his community. So Casper is forced to go to scare school. A place designed to teach young monsters how to strike fear into human hearts. Why? Because he's too young for Monster High, too male for the ghoul school, and too alive for the regular school system. The instructors there have certain techniques of reforming the unfit. Is it horrible? Yes. Will you rule this day forever? <laughs> Will you have nightmares the entire time you're there? Pretty much. So Casper is considered a dangerous abnormality in his community due to his innocent but deviant characteristics he can't control. So he's being sent away to an isolated education center that is designed to punish him for this deviation from societal norms until he's scared into behaving like everyone else. Yep, the plot of this movie is Casper goes to conversion camp! Ben, ben. What? We are graciously given a teaser of a scare asylum, along with the people we're supposed to hate. The Double Headmaster, <laughs> Alder and Dash, which is an obvious play on the word Balderdash, but all to side, these two are voiced by Jim Belushi and the late Bob Saget, and like actual teachers, they hate their jobs because they don't get paid enough to teach those kitties. Wait, they also don't like their boss. I can't wait to get acquainted with the new class. Oh, who are we kidding? I don't know, are we kidding someone? Yes, ourselves. We're the most frightening beings in the business, yet our talents are being wasted teaching the rejects of a creature world to say boo. Alder and Dash pretty much hate everything. They hate each other, and they hate their jobs. Kabosh put them there, so naturally they also hate him and want to seek out a more flattering position than just reject control. And while they have a motivation that makes sense even when their backstory is eventually revealed, Alder and Dash don't do much within the narrative until the climax. Making for pretty unimpressive antagonists. But to be fair, Alder and Dash can sometimes be pretty funny. Good to see you again in these hallowed halls. Kabosh, you look great. Yeah, you look great. I mean, not exactly great, but you look good. Or let's say you're fat and green, but honestly... Oh. What my little other means to say is the toll of your awesome responsibility clearly weighs heavily on your shoulders. You look like garbage. Tired. Back in the cesspool of fish mutants, Jimmy is blaming Casper for going to scare school. Jimmy, they're sending me away. I have to go to scare school. What? What are you talking about? You teach me all this stuff? I make the team, 
and now you're going away. I can't believe this. I don't want to go. They're making me. Well, if you don't want to go, don't. Oh, so Jimmy does have a personality. He's an emotionally manipulative, ungrateful, self-centered, whiny brat. Casper asks his uncles why he has to go. And according to them, if Casper fails school, he is sent to the Valley of the Shadows. If you can't shape up at scare school and stop being friendly, there's a good chance you'll get sent to the Valley of the Shadows. Oh, it's too awful! How bad could it be? Casper, if you get sent there, you can never come back! We can never see you again. And we can never say your name again. It'll be like you never existed. Now we get the school bus, sir, school pirate ship scene. And we meet our generic bully Thatch, voiced by Matthew Underwood. And this is where the writers accidentally put the character bio in the script. If you're new here, and most of you are, I'm Thatch. This is my last year here, and basically, everybody here does what I say. This, as you know, Bob, is an As You Know Bob scene. It's a form of exposition where one character explains to other characters something that they both should already know, but which the audience doesn't. And because this is technically a TV pilot, I get it, characters need to be established. But literally no one in real life talks like this. A character literally prancing around telling everyone their life story is painfully obvious proof that the writers struggled to write a convincing character introduction. So gave up and just handed the audience homework to remember. Also, sunlight doesn't kill vampires. Aboard the magic school ship, we are introduced to the walking nautical pun book and his avian atrocity. We also get to see some of the other students on board. Of course, with all of them being monsters and stuff. The others aren't important, so who cares? But the one this movie will force you to remember is this little vampire muppet that would make Dracula ashamed to be a vampire. His introduction boils down to him being racist and terrible to the new students for no reason. Because remember, kids, villains are fifth-class citizens. Also, why is Quasimodo on the ship? Isn't he just a deformed human? That's a lovely message for the kids. If you aren't conventionally attractive or able-bodied, you're a monster! Thanks, Casper! So Thatch bullies Casper because bully. And now they're rivals. Casper meets Ra and Manfa because friendly ghost. And now they're friends. Relationship development is for losers! Manfa is voiced by Christy Carlson Romano, better known to the world as Kim Possible. She's essentially a zombie activist who wants to prove zombies can be just as capable as others and not as brain dead as people assume. Don't bother caring about her motivation, the movie forgets it too. While Ra is voiced by Keandre Barry, and he's... Uh, got no motivation to speak of. They exist to be Casper's support and have no lives outside of their relationship with him. Fun fact about mummies such as Ra. It is said when the pharaoh dies and goes through the mummification process, they are to be buried with valuables they cherished in the living world, so that they can make the journey with them to the afterlife. So with that in mind, I guess Ra didn't value his personality to accompany him to this movie. They arrive at Scare School, where the color palette goes from disgustingly bright to disgustingly bland. And Kibosh gives them a welcome speech. He then discusses the balance of not scaring humans too much or too little. Which we already know. I'll save you the atrocious son, skip Thatch sucking up to the teachers. Get it? He's a vampire. And definitely skip Alder and Dash scheming because all of the scenes with Alder and Dash are repetitive. Aside from when they first begin to plot to destroy Kaibosh and take over his position as rulers of the underworld. Which is necessary for establishing motivation. But all the other scenes with them are just, we're gonna kill the king! So many scenes in this movie are pointless. I understand that the classroom scenes are necessary for a school setting, but they're not funny or impactful as individual scenes. Honestly, they'd be better paced as a montage. The only thing that matters here is that Casper makes it to Jimmy's soccer game, which was important because the writer said so. Everything else is fluff, including a meaningless chase scene in a public school where they don't need to hide or run away, but everyone is still awake despite it being sleeping hours. Oh my god, mother, the rules here dissolve whenever the plot needs padding. 
Most of this movie is filler and exposition. Plus, the classroom scenes really contradict world building. The characters have to be mean, yet also look out for each other. Yet Casper gets punished for helping his fellow monster? Why is Casper's kindness demonized but characters like Manfa, Ra, and the others go ignored? I understand the conflict, a nice character being forced into a place where kindness is outlawed. But the rules seem only enforced for Casper. He's not only in trouble for the simplest of things, getting gaslit by his own teachers, but when other characters do the same, there's no punishment received. It's frustrating to watch the hypocrisy on display, and not in a way that feels like it's strongly written conflict. The classmates are expected to sabotage each other, yet are both praised and punished at the same time for doing so. Breaking rules is bad, but bad is good in this world, so wouldn't breaking the rules be a sign of good bad behavior? And if helping people in the school is such a crime, then why are the teachers here? Teachers by design are there to help students! The whole movie can be summed up as rules for thee, not for me! The scare school itself is about as lifeless as the people who actually died in this movie. Whatever scenes involving it exist are ultimately used to exposition the audience to death so that they can get accepted into scare school. There's no meaningful scenes with any of the classes. Even when you think something interesting might happen, the professors decide to spend that time shaming Casper for... existing. It's really not fun to watch, especially since the monsters themselves have no consistency in their logic. People can be mean, but also in good spirits with one another. Yet when Casper tries to be civilized, he's put into kid jail instead. It's like Casper is wearing plot armor if it were made of napkins and fig leaves. So Manfa and Ra come up with plans to fake Casper's scariness so he can stay at the school. Such as bribing a sea monster with treats or Manfa dismantling herself and blaming it on Casper. Casper also has a scene where he misses Jimmy's soccer game. And do you think this would lead to conflict? I missed your game. We won! And I scored the winning goal! You did? That's awesome! You were right, Casper. I can do this! Thanks! Well, it's a nice subversion that Jimmy isn't mad at Casper, nothing in the plot is progressed by the scene. We needed more focus on things like Casper's relationships with Manfa and Ra, which are barely developed. Or scenes with expanding fetch beyond a one-dimensional bully. The characters also barely use the abilities of their species aside from comedy. Manfa was talking about how zombies are seen as inferior monsters. So can you tell us more about how the monster class system works? Maybe subplots of Casper helping Manfa and Ra with their goals. This is quite the missed opportunity, but outside of the ghosts, Manfa's leprosy, the skeleton Shapoopy, Professor Notme, and Thatch, nobody really does anything with the monstrous abilities they actually have. They're all just midgets wearing Halloween costumes. It would have been fun if this movie actually committed to the purpose they chose, but... Nah! Let's just take the easy way out and call it a day. Simor and Oriolo will be rolling in their graves with all of the hard-earned 175 US dollars they made off this stupid franchise! So Elder and Dash come up with the idea of turning Kaibosh to stone. 10,000 years here, wiping the noses of these helpless, cretinous creatures. Do we get a statue? I don't think so. I was speaking rhetorically. We don't get a statue. Nah, too bad the real kibosh isn't made of stone. We could smash him and crush him and- Little other, you just had a very, very smart idea. And it should have cut right at the spot. It would give the audience the idea of their evil plan without treating them like morons. You know how this movie also treats the audience like morons? A literal Scooby-Doo chase. Also, do Alder and Dash trust Fatch or not? They keep changing their minds. And guess what? It's another pointless scene. Because Casper's lie is revealed instantly when Fatch uncovers Jimmy's letter. Casper, my soccer game got changed to today. I'll see you at 6.30. I know you'll be there. You haven't missed one yet. Signed, your human friend, Jimmy. My, how conveniently inconvenient!
Befriending a fleshy is considered the worst of the worst things you could do. So Casper has one last chance to not be banished to the Valley of the Shadows. And his chance? A field trip to Who Gives a Crap City! Where they'll spend the entire day scaring people and being graded on how spooky they are. And Casper's assignment for the trip is specifically scaring Jimmy. So the kids go out on the town. In the middle of the day. With no subtlety or extra precautions and just start freaking people out. Also, miss, I hate zombie stereotypes. Is acting like a zombie stereotype. What a shock, the activist was a hypocrite. Wouldn't it be a better montage where Ra and Manfa use their unique abilities to scare others? Oh, right, that would require creativity. Meanwhile, Alder and Dash finish their stone potion and Casper scares Jimmy, thus making their shallow and fragile friendship over. Casper, why you were my friend? You think with how forgiving and understanding Jimmy was in the last scene with Casper, he'd want to talk fiends out or something. But no! What little personality Jimmy had is now demolished. I wouldn't worry about losing Jim Bob. He scared Casper earlier on in the movie, but can't actually handle being scared himself. So honestly, don't feel sorry for Casper losing his best friend. Feel sorry for him because his best friend was a hypocritical jackass who's yet another contestant in the CASPER GASLIGHTING CONTEST! When going back to school, Despite gaining an A-plus on his scaring assignment, Casper decides he'd rather be in the Valley of the Shadows. So, for the betterment of his friends and uncles, he banishes himself. And then we get one of the most pointless, useless scenes I've yet to encounter in any story! The Evil Casper. You can't run from me, Casper. Who are you? I'm you! The monster inside you that wants to make the fleshies run in fear! I thought you were supposed to be a friendly ghost! Idiot! I'm his brother, Jasper! The douchebag ghost! We suddenly have this evil side of Casper who wasn't even conceived until the last possible minute! Casper doesn't have a single bad bone, or any bone, in his body! There wasn't even a snippet of malice within him! He's hated being scary and hurting others this entire time! There was no other side to him! His conflict wasn't that he struggled between wanting friends and wanting to be scary. It was just he wanted to be nice! This internal conflict comes out of nowhere! And when it's over, in less than two minutes, it's never mentioned again. So the famed Valley of Shadows is revealed to be... Florida. The world's largest funeral home. The petting zoo for old people. The dick of America. <sighs> I mean, it's a nice subversion of expectations. And the mystery wasn't spoiled before this. But also was subtle about it being horrible to the monsters. But if the monsters find niceness horrible... Then it makes sense why their idea of hell is basically my little Alice in Wonderland. I, I hate Florida. I, I hate Florida so much. This isn't this isn't this isn't even part of a bit. I hate Florida. I, I want Florida gone and eradicated from this earth. Please donate to my Kickstarter to support the banning of Florida. I beg Yeah, it's not a poorly executed plot point. Here, Casper meets his long glossed Aunt Spitzy. Played by Phyllis Diller. Also, is her hair part of her skull? Is that how she died? Kind-hearted Spitzy understands Casper's struggles, but says he's free to be himself here. So let me guess. You don't like scaring. You enjoy fun, and you like making friends. Yeah. How did you know? Look around, baby. That's all of us. A place where everyone's like me? Except with more hair. <laughs> But unaware that he isn't in danger, the ghostly trio arrives at the school, as they're too worried about Casper. But Alder and Dash use them to see if their potion works on ghosts. Which it works! Even though their ghosts and the goo should have gone through them? After finding out their headmaster's evil plan by actually using their monster abilities, Manfa and Ra go to find Casper with the help of the pirate driver school bus ship dude. But Casper's doing more fine in Ghost Florida than he ever did at school. Until he meets Belle and Murray. Get it? Like Bill Murray? Like the Ghostbuster! It's funny because reference! 
They're voiced by Daryl Dragon and Tony Tennille, who were a musical duo called Captain and Tennille back in the 1970s. I say that because you don't know who they are. Belle and Murray are the aunt and uncle of Alder and Ash that were established in their introduction. Finally, we're getting payoffs for scenes! After a god-awful song number that doesn't even last 30 seconds, Belle and Murray give Alder and Dash's backstory. They used to be a two-headed Casper, but one day, Kaibosh decided to send the ankle to the Gulag because we were too friendly, thus revealing to us the deep-seated hatred the Headmasters actually have for King Slimer. It's not a bad backstory. Perhaps Alder and Dash's deeper motivation for becoming Headmasters was to make kind monsters evil, in order to prevent them from having the same fate as their aunt and uncle. I will admit, it helps add just the tiniest bit more sympathy, even though there wasn't much of it to begin with. And then Kaibosh is turned to stone because the Headmasters are sick of his crap, making you remember that sympathy is for the weak. And the monster students are apparently cool with this whole freezing their king thing. Even though it's technically a political coup. And what kid doesn't like those? They decide to invade the town of Stupidville and turn everyone into statues. Yes, the monsters somehow managed to make an entire arsenal of petrifying goo and weaponry for a whole school in, like, less than an hour. Manfa and Ra find and tell Casper that his uncles are stoned out of their minds. And to be fair, after Casper does this, he immediately has my sympathy. We've all wait! Anyone that stops the awful out of key music in this crappy movie is my best friend. They then play goofy comedic music over what is meant to be the epic heroic speech. Because it's not like you're taking this seriously. We've got 10 minutes of running time left. Who cares? Casper and the nice monsters come to the aid of the humans, with Casper saving Jimmy, and Jimmy still sucks. What's happening? Don't worry, Jimmy. I'll protect you. Yeah, just like the last time. Well, would you look at that. Our evil villains finally had the decency to show up for the climax. On a comically tiny boat, probably to reflect their oversized egos. And we get the final chase scene of the movie. It sucks and I hate it. This climax scene feels faster than Ezra Miller filling out their criminal record. And then Alder and Dash get tripped up. In their rowboat. And after some very stupid scenes with balls in their faces, the world-conquering conquest of Alder and Dash are foiled by a scolding and an off-screen spanking by the Kanko. We're glad to see you too, but you've got some explaining to do. What's all this about taking over the world, upsetting the balance, and turning everyone into stone? It, it was, was his, his idea. idea. No, no, it was, it your, was your idea. idea. <laughs> yes, these two murder-hungry monsters who wanted world domination stop being evil and turn everyone back to normal because they got scolded by Auntie and Unky. This was how the conflict was resolved. Okay, they love and respect their aunt and uncle, but you call this a redemption? A resolution? Reducing your villains to children being scolded? Maybe it could work if Belle and Murray told Alder and Dash the truth about the Valley of the Shadows. Or by disrupting the balance, they're also putting monsters like them in danger. Or even disappointment on how far they've fallen. Nope! Just a, maybe we'll take you out for ice cream if you clean your room and apologize. Give me a break! But luckily, Thatch is still a Thatch hole and tries to stone them. But he's stopped by the Bimbo Calavera Katrinas I forgot to mention because their personality starts and ends at, like, whatever. And everyone gets a happy ending! As the monsters are easily forgiven by the humans and their societies now coexist. Negating the entire point of the school. Spitzy reunites with Stinky, Stretch, and Fatso. Belle and Murray jam out because they were a thing in the 70s. And we get a little twisty twist with Kaibosh. I know you think I've been hard on you. I have. But it's been for a reason. This is a picture of me and my best friends when I was your age. You were friendly too? Growing up is hard. Learning to be scary is hard. But I know you'll figure it out. That's right. Kaibosh had human friends when he was younger. And exactly the same 3D model, but smaller. But wait, if he was so concerned about the balance and not being friends with humans, then why did he have human friends? What happened between Kaibosh and his human friends? 
Why did he have all those beliefs against humans if he liked them before? Ignore this gaping plot hole because school's out. Keep swabbing, matey. Keep swabbing. Like my voice actor sleeping through all of his college courses, Casper's Scare School is a miserable experience that makes you feel like you're watching this against your will by your terrible administrators. There's hardly a live wire or funny bone in this thing's rotting corpse of a body. The jokes are non-existent, the characters feel like they could be summed up in a sentence and a half, the animation and character models are disgusting, the writing is horrifying with how awful and cringe it is, and most importantly, it's not scary, which is just the coffin atop this corpse cake this movie deserves. Casper's Scare School is a failing grade in all aspects. Its most obvious flaws being the hideous character designs, vapid writing, and its attempts to strangle unearned sympathy from the audience by bending its own rules just to make the lead more miserable. Instead of having the characters' traits clash with their world in a way that doesn't feel forced. Casper never challenges the Scare School. He doesn't try to change his classmates' perspectives or his environments. He just keeps getting his beatings. And watching a character do nothing as he's constantly spat on by the world isn't an interesting story. No one learns anything by the end of this, which is ironic for a school setting. The visual style is bland and the animation itself is terrible. Conflicts are paper thin with inconsistent stakes and character motivations that change sporadically. Most of the time, the plot lines end up nowhere. And what little personalities the characters have dissolve in seconds and their actions are meaningless. Now, I didn't dislike everything. Casper himself is very sweet, I enjoy the uncles, and I appreciate that they actually gave the villains sensical motivations, backstories, and some decent humor. But a few funny jokes doesn't make an hour and 20 minute movie worth it. With a lame atmosphere and repetitive babbling about the shallow world building, this movie has no danger, no drama, no nothing of value. This thing should have stayed in the grave. It's as dull as a zombie's rotten flesh, as ugly as a werewolf's butt, and not worth your time, living or dead. You know, I still miss school a lot, Sirius. There's parts of those days I want to get back. But I'm also happy that now I have a lot more freedom to choose the paths I want to take in life. <sighs> the future's wide open for us, Sirius. Now, the only question that remains is where to go from here. The television series! 104 episodes! Let's get to binging! Got another day!